Stars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Santa Clara Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all Santa Clara Sheriff's cars to broadcast 203. Be on the lookout for a man described as heavy set, athletic build, broad shoulders, age 20 to 25 years. This man is wanted for questioning by sheriff's officers. That's all. Officers of the law would be badly handicapped in their war against crime if they had to fight it out with ancient, obsolete flintlock guns. They must have the very best, the most modern, most efficient of equipment, and that includes gasoline. It is therefore a highly significant fact that more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. When the officials of 30 leading cities and counties of California not only recommend, but specify the exclusive use of Rio Grande cracked, they are not experimenting. They passed through the experimental stage long ago when they tested all the various makes. They decided on this superior motor fuel because Rio Grande is the only gasoline which has all the qualities absolutely essential to peak emergency performance. The same never caught nothing getaway. Unfaltering acceleration, greater reserve power, minimum cost mileage, and maximum speed, which won the favor of officials, have caught and held the loyal patronage of motorists by the thousands. If you have not done so, give Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline the chance to prove itself. It will repay you manifold by always giving your automobile police car performance, a possession that means happier days for both your motor and your pocketbook. So do yourself a good turn by visiting your Rio Grande dealer tomorrow morning. Begin the wise habit of automatically asking for police car performance. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline, the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. to hear tonight was taken in the main from the confidential files of the office of the Sheriff of Santa Clara County. And we have asked Sheriff George W. Lyle to prepare a foreword for our program. Occasionally, a person who is not an habitual criminal conceives what seems to him to be a foolproof crime, which he can commit without having to pay for it. Such is the case tonight in the story which has been selected for dramatization. It concerns the crime committed by a man whose previous record was clear. He failed to foresee, or at least to give value to the fact, that his act would bring more suffering to his own and the family of his victim than any amount of other trouble could bring him. Not only the criminal, but at least half a dozen other persons have had to pay for his crime of vengeance. He went into prison a stalwart man. He will come out, if he ever does, a broken and disillusioned old man who will know that crime does not pay. of the night as the stifling fog rolled across the Los Altos hills, a stealthy figure climbed the stone wall. Cautiously, he made his way across green carpeted lawn toward a small door. He opened it carefully, then, cat-like, stole silently to a room where the man and the woman lay sleeping. He paused to listen to the measured breathing of the sleepers. With fingers that trembled with excitement, he switched on all lamp. In his hand, there gleamed the vicious two-edged blade of a knife. He struck... Good Lord. <laughs> you uh, are Mr. Regan? 
Yes. You'd better get medical attention at once. You're losing a lot of blood. Has the doctor been called? Yes. The doctor's been called. It's too late now. She's dead. Now, your wound, though. I'm all right. It's only a flesh wound. Looks like a pretty nasty cut. Right in here, doctor. Thank you very much. I'll see what's going to be done. Oh, good morning, Sheriff. What's the... Oh, I see. Oh, pretty bad cut, isn't it? Your wife, I presume? Yes. Too bad I couldn't have gotten here earlier. Too late now, though. Yes. Too late. You're not so well off yourself. I'd better put a suture or two on that cut. Just sit over here. That's it. Now you can talk to the sheriff while I do this. When did this happen, Mr. Regan? Just a few minutes ago. I I was in bed asleep. I heard my wife screaming. I woke up and saw a man bending over her. He had a knife in his hand, and he was slashing at her. I got out of bed and lunged at him. That's when he, he caught me in the shoulder here. And then he ran out into the hall. What did he look like? He was a young man. I'd say between 20, 25, broad-shouldered, quite a large man. You have any idea who he was? No, I didn't get a very good look at him. I take it that knife on the floor there is the one he used? Yes. I haven't touched it. Well, don't. As a matter of fact, we'd better go into another room and leave everything here just as it is. Oh, through, Doctor? Just about. Are those your trunks, Mr. Regan? Yes. We just arrived from Manila a few days ago. We're visiting my wife's sister here, Mrs. Butts. Was uh, he the one I met downstairs? Yes. Who was the young man? That's my stepson, Charles Smith. He lives here with Mrs. Buck. Oh. Was it dark in here when you woke up? Uh, no. No. Uh, the night lamp was on. Oh, do you leave it on all night? No. The man must have turned it on himself. You say you're from Manila. Have any enemies there? None that I know of. I don't believe I have an enemy in the world. Well, I ask that uh, because it seems such a strange attack. I doubt if a white man would use a knife just like that when they're on the floor. It's more the sort of a thing a Filipino would use. No, I, I don't think it was a Filipino. He was heavy, sir, a large man. I chased him as far as the door. My wife was gurgling, moaning, and trying to speak. I turned and saw that she'd climbed out of bed and had taken a few steps toward the door. It, it was awful. Is that how the bloody footprint came to be on the floor? Yes, that was my wife's footprint. She started to fall, and I caught her and put her back on the bed. Mrs. Buck and I did all we could to stop the blood, but it was no use. I realized she was dying. I ran to the phone and called the doctor and your office. All right, there you are. Now we can go downstairs. You think uh, Mr. Egan will be all right, doctor? Yes, if he takes it easy for a day or two and doesn't get too much excitement. I think it would be a good idea to let him rest a while now. Don't ask him too many questions. All right. I'd like to question some of the others anyway. Uh, right in here, Sheriff. Doctor. I'll be running along, if you don't mind. There's nothing more I can do here. All right, Doctor. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Take it easy now. Don't talk too much. All right. I won't. Uh, Jane, uh, Sheriff Emig wants to ask a few questions. I I think I'll rest a bit, if you don't mind. Not at all. And now, Mrs. Buck, was anything taken from the house, as far as you know? No, there, there wasn't a thing touched. As far as we know, the man ran right out the same way he came in. I heard him run past my door just as I got out of bed after hearing the commotion in my sister's room. Is that all you heard? No. Just a moment after the man ran out, I heard a car start up in the driveway outside the house. There's one thing certain. Whoever did this had a grudge against Egan and his wife. Oh, I can't imagine who it could be. I wonder if it would be an inside job. Now, that stepson of Mr. Egan's. He fits the description of the murderer. Oh, he couldn't possibly do a thing like that. He couldn't be nursing a grudge against his mother for divorcing his father and remarrying. Not Charles. He never hated anyone in his life. I wonder if you'd mind asking him to step in here a minute. Uh, I'd like to talk to him. Not at all. He's right here in the hall. Oh, Charles. The yes. sheriff wants to talk to you. All right, Arthur. Charlie, how old were you when your mother married your stepfather? Oh, I was about eight years old. I notice you still use your real father's name. Why? Well, when Mother married again, I was in school, and it would have been embarrassing to change it. Mm -hmm. How do you and your stepfather get along? Oh, we're pals. He said I could use his name if I wanted to, but now it is. Changing your name all of a sudden. Everyone knew me by my real name, so I just kept on using it. I see. Do you know of any enemies your stepfather or your mother might have who would do this sort of thing? No. Oh, there's no one I know of who hated mother and dad that much. In Manila, 
might have been different. Here in the States, everybody seemed to like them. I only went to Manila for the summer vacations, you see. I don't know who their enemies might be. Oh, well, Dad, Mrs. Buck told me you were asking Charles some questions. And uh, I felt that I probably could give you more information about the family than he could. What made you think I was asking him about the family? Why, I, I don't know. I suppose I just thought it would be the logical thing to do under the circumstances. I see. Well, as a matter of fact, I have been asking him something about the family. But now that you're here, perhaps you can supply the information better. Uh, just what would you like to know? What did you do in Manila? I was president of the exporting firm of Egan and Churchton. I married my wife about ten years ago. Her divorce had been one of those mutually agreed upon things. Which I've often heard of, but have never seen. Anyway, there have always been the most amicable relations between us and Charles' father. As far as the natives went, we never had any trouble while we were on the island. I used to live with Major Churchton and his wife, uh, who's my sister. That was before you married? Yes. I, uh, I don't like to mention this... But you seem to want to know everything. The more I know, the better picture I can form of the motives behind this attack. Well, about six months ago, Churchton and I agreed to dissolve partnership. My sister, his wife, and my wife had never gotten along. I stood it as long as I could. And then we decided to break up the firm. After the dissolution, Major Churchton sued me for the goodwill. He didn't believe that he'd received enough money for his share. The suit is pending. Uh... Of course, what I'm telling you has nothing to do with my wife's murder. But you seem to want to know, so... I think you've told me quite enough, Mr. Egan. At least you've given me some leads to work on. Oh, by the way, do you happen to know where Charles' father is now? Oh, yes. He, he lives over in Piedmont. I can give you the address later. Or you can get it from Charles. Well, I'd like to have a talk with that gentleman. A search of the estate revealed a series of footprints evidently made for the murderer in entering the house and in fleeing from the scene of his crime. Sheriff Emig turned his findings over to investigators from the district attorney's office, and on the following afternoon, we find him in the office of Chief Wallman of the Oakland Police Department. And this case has me up a tree, Bodie. Uh, the church and family lives here in Oakland, and I wish you'd help me check up on them. Okay, but are you sure no one in the house did the killing? Well, at first I thought so, but I'm convinced now that Egan is a reliable witness. He says the attacker was a heavy-set, broad-shouldered man. Doesn't that fit the stepson? Yes, but he's stuck to his story consistently. I can't find any motive for his killing his mother. How about Filipino? Too little. He's just the usual houseboy. Well, I think the best thing for us to do is to take a run out to the Churchton place. Have a talk with the family. on the case. In what way, sir? Well, uh, to put it bluntly, there seems to have been a little trouble between you and Mr. Egan, and we thought... If you it... thought any member of my family murdered Mrs. Egan, you're mistaken, sir. We can account for every move we made last night, or any other... Now, night. don't get us wrong, Major. You see, in a case like this, we can't afford to pass off any leads we might have. Sheriff asked me to come out with him. Well, I... we are not used to being suspected of murder. Well, as a matter of fact, Major, no one suspects you of murder. But now that you mention it, just what did your family do last night? We had a bridge party here last night. Naturally, my wife was hostess. My two younger children helped with the refreshments. Where was your elder son? At work. What time did you go to bed, Major? About one o'clock. All of you? All of us. Did you get up again and go out? Of course not. Uh, Major, would you mind telling us a little about your business relations with Mr. Egan? There weren't any. When he married that woman and brought her to Manila, dissension began almost at once. Egan was my wife's brother. I put up with a lot, I can tell you. When your partnership was dissolved, was that an end of your contact with him? Certainly not. I still have some $50,000 due me from that transaction. The firm's assets are still in litigation. That's why my son George had to leave college and go to work. How does he feel about that? Like any other young man of his spirit would feel. He's disappointed, naturally. Naturally? Was George working all night last night? Yes. Major... Was there any trouble in Manila? I mean, with the natives? No. Why do you ask? Well, this crime is the sort that an Oriental would commit. Hardly a crime characteristic of a white man. Or well, perhaps a man who had spent much time in the Far East might commit. No, there was 
never any trouble like that. You say your son worked all night last night? Yes, from nine until five. I see. Well, thanks, Major. We may call you again, uh, if you don't mind. Not at all. Good day, gentlemen. If I can be of any assistance to you, command me. Well, it's a sense that young George couldn't have been in Oakland and Los Altos at the same time. No, I guess not. Well, that leaves the Churchton family out of it. Well, if I were you, I'd check back to that Filipino houseboy. He's been in the family for years. He, he may be holding out on you. You know how those servants are. Yes, but Egan said the murderer was a big man. Well, after all, it was dark, comparatively, and Egan just awakened out of a sound sleep. Might be mistaken. Yes, that's possible. Well, at any rate, you've got to admit that the murderer had a pretty thorough knowledge of the layout of the house. Yes, it's evident he knew the location of Egan's room. Well, I have a hunch that you'll find somebody who knew that house pretty well, said this. Well, when I get back to Los Altos, I'll, I'll go into this thing from every angle. In the meantime, now let's run down and see what your men have found out about fingerprints on that knife. <laughs> Fingerprints on that butcher knife classified yet? No, sir. The knife's too smudged to show any prints. However, there are indications that the man who used the knife wore cotton gloves. Gloves? Yes, sir. See? Right there. There's an enlargement of one of the smudges. Those crisscross lines are fabric lines. Can you tie that? Well, that lets the oriental element out. Yep. While you were gone, a couple of men from the DA's office brought in this five-gallon can of kerosene. Where did that come from? They found it sitting on the wall out at the Egan place. Yeah, I suppose he still had his gloves on when he handled that. Well, assuming the same man carried that has committed the murder. Sure. There are lots of smudges, but no prints. Well, I'll put a couple of my men on this and try to trace that knife. Might as well look for the well-known needle as for the place that that can was sold. Uh, did you take pictures of these things, Joe? Yes, sir. Well, we'll run them in the evening papers. Maybe somebody will recognize them. Find out about that can and the knife. Hmm. Boy, can you pick out the job? What's the trouble? Well, I traced that knife to the manufacturer and then to the jobber, and he gave me the name of the merchant that sold it. How do you know that? Well, you remember those little blue marks on the blade? Uh, those things that looked like Egyptian hieroglyphics? Yeah. Well, those are the jobber's marks, and told him where the knife was sold. And where was that? Maxwell Hardware at 14th and Washington. Check with them? Yeah, they only had two left out of the last lot, and remembered selling one to a heavy set fellow a few days ago. What makes them remember him? Well, this particular knife isn't an ordinary butcher knife. It's a special implement used for killing pigs. So the fellow didn't look like a butcher, and they remember him, eh? That's about it. Does the clerk think he could recognize the man he sold the knife to? Well, he's not sure, but he said he'd try. Well, our oriental mystery goes up in the smoke of a 50-cent butcher knife. Well, why don't we get a completely unbiased view of this thing from someone who knows the families well? For instance, a young Charlie Smith's father. That's an idea. He might throw some light on this mess. Uh, Murphy, you can go out and uh, learn something more about young Churchton and that young Charlie Smith while we're gone. Okay, sir. A few hours later, found the Oakland chief of police and Sheriff Emig in the sitting room of a large and luxuriously furnished house in the exclusive Piedmont section of the city. Uh, Mr. Smith, sir. We're trying to get a little information about some of the people who might possibly be involved in this Egan case. Oh, yes, I know. My son came over to see me this morning. Uh, we thought that, uh, with your knowledge of the two groups, uh, you might have some of the information that we lack. May I ask you rather a personal question, Mr. Smith? Certainly. I understand your divorce was a very quiet affair, a mutual agreement. That's right. I prefer to let my wife go than to spend my life bickering and quarreling about non-essential things. I realized that the boy would be happier with her than with me, so he lived with his mother. I saw him occasionally. And how were your relations with the Egans? Hmm, as friendly as possible under the circumstances. Uh, just what position does Mrs. Buck occupy in this setup? Mrs. Buck is the real power behind the firm of Egan and Churchton. She always held the majority of the stock. Most of the money in the firm was hers. Hmm, evidently explains how Mrs. Egan had so much influence. Yes, it does. Of course, Churchton and Egan took out good money in salaries, but after Egan married Mrs. Buck's sister, things didn't go so smoothly with the firm. And the Churchtons came over here to this. There was pressure brought on Churchton to get him out. I rather think that Mrs. Egan prevailed upon her sister to force the issue in that case. I understood they bought the major out. Well, they paid him in cash for his stock, I believe. But he felt that he never received a just amount from his holding. Now, he told us that a suit was pending against the firm. Yes. And I doubt that any civil court in this country will allow his claim. All this is very interesting, Mr. Smith. 
I wonder if you know of any enemies that either the Major or Mr. Egan might have made in the island. I'm not prepared to answer that, Sheriff. I really don't know much about the way the Egans and the Churchtons lived in Manila. I wouldn't be surprised, however, now that my ex-wife is dead, to see the Major back in the firm. Is that so? It was really she who prevailed upon Mrs. Buck to force him out. She never did like the Major. Well, uh, Mr. Smith, I, I think that's about everything we need to know. And thank you very much for being so kind as to help us out. Not at all. Anything I can do, I should be glad to do. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good day. Good morning, gentlemen. I hope I've been of some assistance to you. Did you hear what I heard? That Mrs. Egan never did like the Major? <laughs> yes. I think our best bet is to pick up the Major and ask him some questions. Well, better go easy. After all, he's a prominent man. Besides, he's already told us that he was in bed last night. Nothing to keep him from getting up, committing a murder, and going back to bed. <laughs> Police headquarters, Major Churchton proved a stumbling block to the sheriff and detectives. Not only did he answer all questions in a straightforward manner, but he spoke so freely of his relations with the Egan that he established a strong belief as to his innocence. Well, it's no use. Churchton's actions are those of an innocent man. Alibi is perfect. At least it seems so. Yeah, it looks that way. We might as well release him. Yes, I suppose so. Well, let's see what Murphy found out. Is Murphy out there? Oh, sir. He's questioning young George Churchton in room 47. Now, tell him to bring the young man in here. Yes, sir. Murphy must have had something in mind to have picked up young Churchton. Wonder what he found out. Well, yeah, we know in just a minute. Well, Murphy, how are you coming? Yeah, pretty good, Chief. Sit down, George. Thanks. I've been finding out a lot of things since you left, Chief. Yeah, let's hear them. Well, I talked to Churchton's boss out at the restaurant. I asked him if he had personal knowledge that George worked all night, and he said he didn't. I talked to the bird that works with George, and he admitted that he'd relieved Churchton at 2 o'clock instead of at 5 as he was supposed to. Why did he lie about it in the first place, George? Well, we'd been changing our hours around a little to suit ourselves, and we didn't want the boss to know about it. And what were you doing away from work at that hour? I was keeping a date with a girlfriend. You're trying to shield a girl? Yes, sir. 2 o'clock isn't a very good hour to have a date, is it? No, sir. What if her parents found out about it? They won't. What makes us sure of that? I'll never tell you who she is. You're a little dram- melodramatic, aren't you? Just the same, I'll never tell. Okay. Just charge you with murder. Go ahead. You can hang me before I'll tell you. Take him out, Murphy. Well, what next? Stick around. Let I miss my guess. Murphy knows who the girl is. Think so? Well, I'll better let Dollar in be back here in a minute and tell us all about her. Right in here, miss. Oh, uh, Chief, this is Claire Burnett. At least that's her name for it. She's young Churchton's girlfriend. Yeah, sit down, Miss Burnett. Thank you. Where were you with young Churchton on the night his aunt was murdered? Well, uh, no, I wasn't. I saw him the next night, though. Are you sure you didn't see him that night? Yes, I'm sure. It's funny, though. On that night, I had a bad dream, and and I woke up screaming. Uh, You had a dream? Yes. Barbara Ross, my roommate, was in bed with me. I woke her up. I told her that I had dreamed a waiter in a white suit had killed his aunt. Well, what is this, a fairy tale? No, sir, it's the truth. I did dream it. Are you sure you didn't dream it because George uh, Churchton had told you he was going to kill his aunt? Oh, no, sir, he didn't tell me. Ask my roommate. She'll tell you I had that dream. It isn't the dream we're doubting. It's the convenience of it, coming right at this time. We've talked to the roommate. This girl's telling the truth as far as it goes. Well, dreams aren't acceptable as evidence. It's a sin. Churchton is trying to conceal the identity of his girlfriend because he's afraid she'll admit he told her he was going to murder his aunt. No, that's not true. As a matter of fact, he told you that if his aunt rattled away, all his family troubles would be over, didn't he? No, he didn't. Bring Churchton in, Mark. Miss Burnett. I think we ought to warn you that you're in a tough spot. What do you mean? You're concealing valuable information that we need in this case. We can hold you as a material witness until Churchton is brought to trial. However you look at it, you lose. Claire! Oh, George. What are you trying to do to her? I'm trying to get the truth, Churchton. Well, she doesn't know anything about it. We have reason to believe she does. I tell you, she doesn't know anything about this affair. Uh, you probably haven't heard about the dream of her. What dream? George, don't let them trick you into saying anything. All that stuff about dreaming of seeing a waiter kill his aunt. Well, we think she knows more about this than she's telling. As a matter of fact, we think she's in on it. Maybe she even helped you do it. I tell you, she had nothing to do with it. I'll tell you who did it. I did. Nobody helped me. I killed my aunt, and I'll do it again. I had to leave college because of her. I had to work as a waiter because of her. I never had a chance to live like other kids my age. No fun. No dates. No money. Nothing but work. Every night, the same thing. Work. Standing there, night after night. 
Watching other kids have a good time. Watching people make hogs of themselves. Don't, George. I watched Dad worrying about money, worrying about the firm. I brooded over it for a long time. And then I decided that the best way out of it was to kill her. Oh, George. I went up to my aunt's house, to Mrs. Bunch, late at night. I knew where my aunt and uncle were sleeping. I switched on the light and I killed her. And I'm glad I did it. George Kirsten was tried for the murder of his aunt, found guilty, and sentenced to life in prison. Another crime that did not pay. Why are Sinclair motor oils so universally popular with millions of motors in 45 nations of the world? This is the answer. No matter what the climate, and regardless of sudden changes, this world-favored lubricant refuses to either break down from heat or congeal from cold. It is both heat-proof and cold-proof because the patented Sinclair process completely removes petroleum jelly and wax. The very parasites which make most so-called good oils break down under summer heat and become sluggish when put to the cold test of winter weather. If you have not yet joined the international parade of motorists throughout the world who rely on this superior lubricant, now is the time to Sinclairize for safety. Take on a crankcase full of Sinclair Opaline, the smoother, tougher motor oil that keeps it smooth, even flowing tempered in all kinds of weather. Sinclair Opaline comes to you in the sealed, tamper-proof cans at only 25 cents a quart. Better ask your Rio Grande dealer for a refill tomorrow morning before your motor comes down with an attack of automotive influenza. Inoculate your motor against cold weather ailments. Sinclair eyes for safety with Sinclair motor oils at the same Rio Grande station where you're in the habit of getting your police car performance Rio Grande cracked gasoline. The motor fuel which officials and the drivers of emergency equipment have made the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation of broadcast 203 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande.